Um, summer is officially over. You know, Big 12, uh, Big 12 Media Days is here, and so uh, it's an exciting time of the year. I know, um, I know our players are excited, uh, our fans are excited. You know, it's just that time of the year that everybody's got a little bit of optimism. Um, just want to start out by thanking Brett Yormark and his leadership uh, from the from the Big 12. I think we're incredibly well positioned uh, because of his strong leadership and his vision. Um, I think it's led to to this event today uh, and the stability you know that the Big 12 has now. I think the the brighter days are ahead for the Big 12. Love the position that we're in. You know, and again, a lot of that has to do with uh, the investment from the universities. I'm certainly uh, blessed to be at TCU where football is important and it's important to uh, our university and to our leadership. And I uh, thank Chancellor Pullen and uh, Chancellor Boschini and President Pullen for their support and Jeremiah Donati and just really blessed to be here. So, like I said, it's an exciting time of the year. I wore a suit in, in honor of, of Brett Yormark. He's always the best dressed guy. So I, I ordered an Armani suit, and then I realized that mine came and it spelled Ormani instead of Armani. So I, I guess it's a different suit than he's got, but uh, I did my best. So glad to be here, excited about our team. We got five really high quality young men with us today uh, that you guys are gonna have a chance to get to know a little bit. And, you know, I think we're in a good place. We, we had a heck of a run in 2022. It was a fun, fun year where everything went our way. Um, we had some tremendous leadership, a lot of experience on that team that we lost a lot of that last year and really didn't do the little things right that it takes to win football games. And, and that really boils down to coaching. So we got to do a better job coaching this year. Certainly uh, didn't get the carryover from that national championship run in 22 to 23 that we wanted to. I think that's college football. I think you're going to look around and see some teams that are really good one year and, and maybe struggle a little bit the next. And that was certainly us last year. And now we're ready to get back uh, playing TCU football. So again, excited to be here. Look forward to seeing you all today. And and uh, let's get this thing started. OK, we'll take questions right down here in the second row on the left side. Please raise your hand, and again, when you get the handheld microphone, we ask that you please stand to pose your questions. Please state your name and affiliation. Uh, Steven Johnson, Fort Worth Star Telegram. Sonny, what have you seen from this group from the spring, some of your off-season workouts that kind of gives you the confidence that you guys can get back to playing TCU football? Um, for, first of all, Steven, thank you for doing a great job covering us. Um, you know. You're there all the time at practice, and so it doesn't go uh, unnoticed and appreciated, and, and really uh, appreciate the work that you do for us and, and the pride you take in covering our program. Um, I think we've come a long way. I mean, I just think our, our attitude, our the standard that these players set for each other and hold themselves to is different than last year's team. Um, you know, I just I like the leadership of this group. You know, to me, it's it's a team-oriented team. You know, the guys care about each other. There's not a whole lot of talk about individual accolades or getting to the league or any of that kind of thing. And and um, the guys want to win, and the guys want to lay it on the line for each other and lay it on the line for TCU. Um, so it's a it's a uh, it's a it's a great feeling team. I mean, it has the hunger that, that successful teams have and the determination that successful teams typically have. Um, you know, we're like everybody else. I mean, it's, it's a new league. It's a, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be different. New additions to the league, a lot of uncertainty. Um, but I love our mentality. I love our attitude. I love the work ethic. I, I like the toughness of this group. You know, I don't think this group wants anything to be handed to them. I think they want to scratch and fight and earn everything they get. And uh, I, I really love that mentality. And I think it's a talented group. You know, we've got the right mix of, of experience coming back, but also a lot of really dynamic young players that I think are really going to help us. Okay, we'll stay on the left side, third row. Hey, Sonny, Colin Wilson with the Action Network. 
We're going to transition from Joe Gillespie to Andy Avalos, and both highly aggressive. But one runs a three-man front with yep. Gillespie, and then a four-man front with Andy. What drew you to Andy Avalos, and do you expect to be a four-man front, even with the portal activity that happened? Yeah, actually? yeah, 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 um, yeah, for sure. The good thing about the four-man front is it's kind of counterintuitive to what you think. Defensive linemen and high quality defensive linemen are really difficult to recruit, okay? So you say, well, you're going from, if you're three down, you only have to recruit three, and if you're four down, you have to recruit four. Not entirely true. I think when you're three down, you've got to recruit three big guys. Those are the hard guys to find. Um, and what that does now is that changes a little bit of the makeup of your defense when it comes to being able to get speed on the field. What I love about the four down system is it's, um, you, you know, you're playing with two traditional big defensive linemen, obviously a nose guard and a three technique, but then you can play with a lot of different body types on the edge. Um, and that can vary honestly from week to week. Uh, and, and your opponent and who's gonna get the lion's share of the playing time. And, and so it, it allows you to get a little more speed, a little bit more of a pass rusher on the field. I love this group of, of pass rushers that we have. I think that that's going to be the biggest um, area of improvement for us is pressuring the quarterback. And when you pressure the quarterback, that changes the game. You know, I think that's all you have to do is look at the NFL and, you know, the two highest paid positions are the quarterback and the guy that pressures the quarterback. So obviously those two areas are, are, are really important. Um, and, you know, we're going to be able to throw a lot of different body types out there and guys that can run and guys that can be aggressive and, and uh, we can create some good matchups on the edge and also hold up against the run, you know, as a four down as well. So I like the versatility of it. I really have been excited about Andy. You know, he's a former head coach. Two years ago, he was a Mountain West Coach of the Year. It was a 10 and two record as a first year head coach. Um, the guy's been around successful football his whole life, his whole career, you know, at Boise and, and as the defensive coordinator at Oregon. He believes in creating havoc defensively, and I think that's what you have to do in today's college football world. If you let quarterbacks sit back there and have time, they're going to dissect you. The game has changed. I mean, it's just different. There's so many good quarterbacks now. There's so many effective and efficient offenses uh, that people are running. Um, I think it really puts a premium on pressuring the quarterback, and, and I think this team's going to be able to do that because of Andy and, and really a lot because of our, our players and their abilities. All right, we'll go to the right side in the middle. Melissa Trebowasser, Dave Campbell, it's Texas football. Coach, you inherited a lot of defense and or a lot of leadership in 2022. You lost that in 2020-23. Yep. How are you developing it for 2024? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think that, you know, when you have a year like we had in 2022, the assumption is, okay, these young players are going to watch these older players, you know, guys like Max Duggan and guys like D. Winters and, um, you know, just a, a wealth of, of experience and leadership. And you think Wes Harris, you know, and you think that, Guys are going to watch them and they're going to learn from them. Well, what happens in today's college football world is you turn over almost half your roster now every year. And so there were not that many players when it was all said and done. We lost a lot of juniors to the NFL draft, guys that came out early. Um, and so what we have to do now is we have to make sure that we don't rely on our players to teach that and to pass that tradition on. That's got to be something that that we teach as coaches. And so we've taken a much more active approach in trying to, number one, create relationships with our players, to be very intentional about, you know, just getting together, spending time together, um, you know, doing things outside of football to earn each other's trust um, and, and to get the guys, number one, to just know each other. Because as I said, the roster turns over so much. The one thing that I think we did a good job of this year was most of our transfers came in in January and, uh, and those guys went through spring ball and assimilated more into a team. But we've done a lot of things from, from a leadership class that we're currently teaching to our players right now um, to just being more intentional about the, the things that we teach and the values that we try to instill with our student athletes. And so that to me is going to be critically important moving forward in college football again when you lose so much of your roster like you do every year. 
You got a question right down here, front row, right in the center. Kenneth Mary, touchdowns and tangents. Uh, Coach Dykes, just in regards to obviously coached at Cal for a while, so you're familiar with the four corner teams coming in. Just from how stacked the Big 12 is, and from when you were coaching the Pac-12 at the time, how do you kind of compare the parity yeah. and the teams you're going to be playing and the intensity in which, you know, you, you can't really drop a game. You can't really afford to, especially with 16 teams in the conference. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good point, a good question. Um, yeah, so I'm familiar with, with all the new additions really over the last two years. Uh, you know, most of the teams coming from the American prior uh, when I was at SMU and now uh, the four teams coming from uh, the, the Pac-12, um, you know, my time at Cal, uh, I coached against them. So I think I've coached against all 16 current members of the, of the Big 12. You know, and, and every team has its own personality and every team has its own niche and, and way that they have to be successful and, and you know, develop in their program. Um, you know, I think what what makes the Big 12 unique is parity. You know, if you look if you look at the Big 10, you look at the SEC, you look at the ACC, the same teams have represented those leagues year in, year out in, in the conference championship games. In the last three years, six different Big 12s have been in the, six different Big 12 teams have been in the championship game. So I think right there, that speaks to the parity of the league. Um, you know, it does remind me a little bit of the Pac-12 when I was at Cal. Every team in the league is good. Every team in the league is capable of beating any other team on any given Saturday. I don't know that that's the case in some of the other leagues. Um, and we'll see how that, that plays out. Uh, but I really truly believe top to bottom, this is going to be the most competitive league in college football. I mean, I really truly believe that. Um, you know, you just look at the number of one score ball games in the Big 12, uh, and you look at the number of successful teams and how many one score ball games that they've played, you know, it's going to come down to one possession. You know, you look at our 22 team, we were seven and one in one score games. That was the difference with the loss being to Kansas State in the, in the Big 12 championship. You look at our team last year, we were 0-4 in one score games. So that really determines your success in the Big 12. And it comes down to very minute details. And it comes down to your players playing very disciplined blend of football, playing with precision, playing with confidence, and then making good decisions. So. You know, it's going to be a great league to watch week in and week out. Um, you know, obviously we're adding some very uh, successful teams. You know, you look at Utah and the success they've had over the last 20, 25 years. It's been on par with just about anybody in college football. Um, you know, you look at the, the, the team that Arizona had last year. You know, you look at the, the history of Arizona State football and, and the, the potential of that program and then obviously Colorado. And so, you know, those are four quality teams that you know, we all have their own niche and are all very unique and very different. All right, final question will come on the far right back. Hi, Coach Dykes. Uh, Alex Blackburn, College Football Dogs. Uh, how far... Is that D-O-G-S or D-A-W-G-S? Uh, D-A-W-G-S. Okay, well, I know where you're from, then. You're from the South. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually from Missouri. Yeah. Not That's Missouri. close enough. Yeah, it's yeah. an SEC, right? Close enough, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but my question is, uh, how far do you think the quarterback room has gone from last year to this year, knowing the experience that Josh Hoover got and knowing the strengths in the receiving core that returned? Yeah, you know, um, I, yeah, I really like our, our quarterback room. As you said, you know, Josh Hoover got a, quite a bit of experience last year. Then we took a, a transfer from Vanderbilt, Ken Seals, and Ken played, started 16 games at Vanderbilt. We felt like we needed to, to bring somebody in that had experience. And then we've got a young quarterback, Haas Haney, that, you know, quarterback at Alito, I think was 45 and three as a starting quarterback at Alito and had tremendous success and is a tremendous athlete. And, you know, grew up his whole life uh, as a TCU fan. So I love the room. I love the, all three of the guys are different. I think they all have different strengths. 
I think the experience that Josh got last year was invaluable. You know, he performed uh, really, really well in his first start. Uh, came out and threw, I think, for over over 400 yards, maybe close to 500. His first time out as a starter. Uh, really performed well. And then we had some ups and downs, you know, and I think we were very inconsistent. And, you know, we didn't always put him in the best position, I think. And, and, um, and you know, we had some growing pains. And that's what you expect when you have a young quarterback. But I love his experience. Again, I love what Ken brings to the table with his 16 starts. And I love the, the big play ability that Haas brings. So, like I said, it's a very unique quarterback room. Um, all different different guys, different strengths, different abilities. Um, really fired up. I think we're, you know, I think Josh has, a, has an opportunity to be one of the, the elite quarterbacks in the league this season. Would expect him to play at a really high level. I don't know that I've been around too many guys that are more dedicated and mature uh, and more kind of proficient in the way that he handles his business. Every day he wakes up, he's got a plan to get better and improve um, and, you know, creates relationships incredibly well. The guys admire him, they respect him, they like him, um, you know, and I think that they're going to go lay it on the line for him every Saturday. So I'm, I'm fired up about him and what he brings to that room and what that room's all about. Okay, great. Thanks, Sonny. Okay, thank you.